you are in your 20s? Okay, young crowd. How many of you have been through your 20s? Okay, but not all hands are up. How many of you remember your 20s? <laughs> there are two, actually three, big moments in my 20s that I remember. The first one is when I gave birth to my daughter, who's now 18. Where has the time gone? The second one was when I was told that I was diagnosed with a stage four cervical cancer and was given, this is the hand gesture that he gave me, given about a year to live. And my whole world just dropped. My daughter at the time was three years old and I was a young upstart in, in the financial services field. And so I went home, and kind of like in a daze. What am I supposed to do with this? What now? And paralyzed and angry. Because I was thinking, you know, like my whole full life is ahead of me. What the heck? Who decided that this was the best plan? There's a word called crisis. The Chinese character is a composite word in Chinese. It has two, two uh, characters in the Chinese language. So the first uh, character stands for danger. A crisis has a danger component to it. The second character is opportunity. It also has opportunity embedded in it. And it's almost like the, the very raw ingredient of your crisis has the solution embedded in it. And so I had to get really clear about what I was going to do. That this was not an indictment on the end of my life. And I remember a mentor once told me, you're going to have to make a decision. You know, because I was going back and forth. What am I going to tell my family? What am I going to tell my daughter? How am I going to plan for the end? Who has an estate plan in their 20s? What do you even put in it? And so. My mentor said to me, you're going to have to make a decision. Do you want to live or do you want to die? Because the things that you have to consider when you're preparing to die are very different than the things that you must consider if you're choosing to live. If you're going to choose to live, some of those things, all of those things, you can't even look at them. You cannot even consider them. And if you're choosing to die, then it doesn't matter what alternative healing methods are out there, et cetera. That's, that's not your bag, right? How many of you have read Shakespeare? Romeo and Juliet, anybody? You know how that ends? Yeah, not good for Romeo. And for a lot of us, we tend to associate ourselves as though we are a character in some life story that we're playing. And my challenge to you is, what if you're Shakespeare? What if the pen is in your hand and you can actually decide how the story ends? So there are four pivot questions that I have used myself and that I use with my coaching clients to get them to get centered and clear on what it is that they want to create. Because as you can imagine, a lot of people can come to uh, you know, their corporate job or even their relationships and they know exactly what the problem is and how that person jacked it up and how they're at fault. And I know exactly, I can just I outline for you exactly how it is that you jacked it up and how you can fix it. And we tend to forget that even though the circumstances may be beyond your control, what you do with it is up to you. So the first pivot question that I ask myself is who's speaking? Who is speaking? There's a part of us that has access to inner wisdom, that has access to infinite patience. Some of us haven't tapped into that in quite some time, but maybe you have if you have children. And there's a part of you that has those limiting beliefs and believes you to be small. So I want you to do something for me real quick. I want you to put out your hands in fists like this. Separate them, don't put them together, just separate them. And I want you to imagine that on the right hand, you have the vilest, most disgusting, smelliest, 
ickiest piece of dung. If you can even imagine you holding yourself a piece of dung in your hand. And on the left, you have the most amazing, unimaginable, beautiful, awe-inspiring diamond. As the author of your life, you're doing this or this. Thank you, put your hands down. Although it would be quite entertaining to just conduct the entire presentation with you like this. So we walk around in our lives as though we are holding this dirty little secret that if people knew who we really were, they'd find out what a piece of crap we were. They'd find out how small or those dark times that you perhaps were a coward or perhaps you sold out to convenience or in any other way that you weren't your best. But I posit that the essence of you is this, is the diamond, that you step to the left and re-identify yourself as the, not only the author of your life, but the enjoyer of that life. And so, whenever I heard myself saying something like, I don't know what I'm doing, how the heck am I gonna get through this? I would ask, who's speaking? And something that always used to center me is, if I just think in your mind something that you like to say to yourself, that's like your favorite excuse. I don't have whatever, I don't have time, I don't have money. And change the I to God and see if it still makes sense. And I would do this with myself. I don't have time, God doesn't have time. Well, I don't have the money for medicines or whatever. God doesn't have money. I don't know what I'm doing, God doesn't know what I'm doing. And so, eventually, I would just laugh myself out of my own absurdity. Because in my paradigm, that doesn't fit. So that's the first pivot question, is who's speaking? The next question is, what do you get by being right about this? See, sometimes we tend to argue for our limitations. But you don't understand. I really am broke. But you don't understand. My schedule really is filled to the gills. What do you get out of being right? Because we as human beings are very, very smart. We never do anything for no reason. And even if you said, well, I don't get anything out of playing small. Yeah, you do. Maybe you get to be exempted from responsibility. Maybe you get for people to lay off your back. Maybe you get to be among friends because everybody else is playing small and I don't want to stand out. You get something. So ask yourself, what do I get out of being right about this? The next question is, what is it costing me? How is this costing me? Because for everything that we do, that we get a payoff for, we also have a cost. There's a price that you pay when you play small. You know, I've had many, many times when I have told myself that I was going to start XYZ diet or start XYZ workout system, etc. And if I told myself, okay, that's it, Monica. I'm gonna to go to the gym, and tomorrow, not today, but tomorrow, <laughs> at six o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna be there bright and early. 98% of the time, I was lying to myself. And you know, there's a part of you that says, girl, you know you're not going to do that. But if I told you that I was gonna show up at the gym at six o'clock, I'll be there at 5.55, bright and early, ready to go. Let's see who gets to the treadmill first, sucker, right? And so, the reason why is because it matters. The reason why is because my word to you matters. And a lot of times, what ends up happening is that's the very thing that's costing you. When you play a limited small game, you're actually sacrificing and surrendering your word. When you lie to yourself, when you say you're going to do something and you don't do it, there's a person inside, and, and neutral observer, if you will, that uh, knows you're bullshitting and keeping score. So the fourth, of course, the fourth question, of course, tends, you, tends to drive you to execution. So what, now what? You know, we like to journal things out and we like to talk about it with our friends and maybe go to therapy and get a coach, and, but eventually, after all that talking and all that considering and all that working stuff out, you're gonna have to do something. So I'm gonna take you through four pillars of discipline that requires your full participation in each one of them. 
in order for the internal master, the internal author, the internal Shakespeare to come out, these four pillars of discipline have to be in place. So the first one is an environmental audit. And what that means is that you are just checking yourself, checking your physical environment, your car, your apartment, your house, your clothes, physical stuff. Check that. Does that all play in alignment with the level of excellence, the level of mastery, the level of leadership, the level of badass that you say that you are? And then your mental environment. What are your thoughts? What are you telling yourself? See, the most important conversation that you're ever going to have is the one that you have with yourself about yourself, particularly when nobody else is listening. Because that conversation is the one that informs all other conversations. And so the physical, the emotional environment as well, what's your go-to emotion? When somebody does something unfair, what's your go-to? Some people get sad. Some people get indignant. Some people get angry. Check yourself on the emotional side as well. And then, of course, the intellectual piece. And intellect isn't just about being smart or being intelligent. It's about putting those pieces together and then making something out of it. So the second uh, discipline is external accountability. Like I said, if I tell myself that I'm going to go to the gym, maybe not. If I tell you that I'm going to go to the gym, I'm there. When you set yourself up with external accountability measures, an accountability buddy, a boss, believe it or not, your coworkers, etc., then you are already setting yourself up for peak performance because the very act of observing yourself or of being witnessed elevates your performance. Have you ever noticed that trainers and, and health nutritionist people, they always tell you to log your food? Don't change anything yet, just log your food. And you just kind of like, you, I can't eat this entire cheesecake if I have to write this down, All right? Just the very act of being observed, of being witnessed, is enough to elevate your peak performance. And so the third um, discipline is expert guidance. I don't know where I would be today had my mentor not said to me, you have a choice. I don't even think I'd be here had she not asked me that question. Neutral, charge neutral. She wasn't expecting a particular answer. She was like, you have a decision to make. And then the fourth one is execute and flow. That means you get to do something about this. So many people that know me know that I am a movie buff. I love movies. I love songs. I was joking with someone earlier that I have musical Tourette's. That means we'll be in conversation and a song will pop up and I just have to sing it. And I remember a movie that changed me to my core. And that was Saving Private Ryan. Did you see that? How many of you saw it? It came out right around the time. Well, it came out a few years before my cancer diagnosis, but that was around the time that I'd seen it. And there's a scene when, if you haven't seen the, uh, for the, those of you who haven't seen it, there's a private, Ryan, played by Matt Damon, who has to be saved because he's the only surviving son of this mother with five children. And so Tom Hanks, God bless his heart, and his whole crew come to where save a, uh, Private Ryan is so that they can save him and bring him home. It costs Tom Hanks' character, the captain, his life. And the one that found him as he was perishing was Private Ryan. And he was like, come on, we can do this. You don't, have to, you don't have to languish here. And he knew that this was his last breath. The captain knew this was it. And he grabbed Private Ryan and he said, earn this. So then the movie fast forwards to Private Ryan as an old man standing at the tombstone of his captain and his wife. Comes, at, uh, comes to see if he's okay. He's older now, maybe a man in his 60s, 70s, and he's just kind of recalling who he's been in his life. And he turns to his wife and he says, have I been a good man? Because he remembered that he had a promise to earn this life. And so I want you to look at yourself, put your hands in front of you, and sometimes, we're in a time of doubt. Touch your right hand. 
what you're touching is matter. So if you ever have a question about whether what you do or who you are matters, that's been squashed. We have proof. You matter. And now, what you get to do is design and live your life in such a way that if this was your magnus opus, if your life was a book and you were offering this book to the world, what does that say about you? Because you are the author and the protagonist. And so what do you get to say? In most of the, of the uh, spiritual traditions, there's a point where the favorite disciple asks the master or the guru, and the guru turns back to him and says, who do you say that I am? And life is asking you the same question. Who do you say that you are? And so a lot of times we tend to uh, just position the, the good stuff, right? We want you to see our successes, our degrees, our accomplishments, because all that is is just kind of the covering for the piece of dung that we think we are or that we suspect that we are. But when you're the diamond, you can't wait to unleash all that. And there's a part of pressure. It takes pressure to create a diamond. It's messy. It's chaotic. And so if you don't see the whole process through, you won't end up with this. That's why you get to thrive through it. Because even the darkness and the shadows, that is the raw material for the amazing piece of treasure that we all are and that we get to be and that we get to live out. And so, my last question, as you walk out of here and you step into your life, in every moment, life is asking you, who do you say that you are? Thank you.